Hi, this is Mrs. KJ here going over 3.02, the dissolving process. As always, make sure you are taking notes and hitting pause when you need to. So from lesson 3.01, a quick review, when a solute dissolves in a solvent, a solution is formed. So in this lesson, now we're going to look at how solutions form. So the first word that we're going to have for this lesson is dissolution. So if you notice the word solution is in it and starting with the prefix dis and dissolution is a very fancy way to say dissolve. I don't know why they just don't always say dissolve. It means the same thing. And dissolution and dissolving mean specifically the breaking up of a solute in a solvent. Take a closer look at the factors that control the dissolving process. Suppose you put a cube of salt in a glass of water. As you can see here, the molecules of water bombard the surface of the salt cube. So here's our salt cube, which is made of NaCl. So the purples are the sodiums, the greens are the chlorine, and it's being bombarded or attacked. It's very violent by water molecules. And as it's being attacked, pieces are breaking apart. That's the dissolving. We had one big NaCl cube with lots and lots and lots of NaCl molecules bound together and the water comes here and breaks them apart and separates them apart. The process continues until the salt molecules are mixed among the water molecules. That describes the dissolving process or dissolution of a salt cube. The molecules of the solvent bombard the molecules of the solute breaking down the solid. And of course, it doesn't always have to be a solid. It can be liquids and gases. Substances dissolve as a result of the collisions of molecules. Random molecular motion leads to collisions, which cause the solute to break up. That breaking up process is also called dissolving. So all molecules are randomly moving. Remember, because this was a solid, they were just vibrating and staying really close here. The water is liquid. It moves farther and faster. It hits it, breaks everything apart. So dissolution equals dissolve. What does the word rate mean? Rate is how fast something happens. Therefore, dissolution rate means a measure of how fast a solute dissolves in a solvent. Our second word that we have for this lesson is solubility. Solubility is a measure of how much of a solute can dissolve in a solvent under certain conditions. So key thing here, how much. Solubility is how much can dissolve. Dissolution rate is how fast. So we're going to talk about how fast dissolution rate and how much solubility can dissolve. So solution formation depends on solubility, how much. It depends on dissolution, how fast. And how fast and how much depends on temperature and other factors. So we're going to look at the other factors and temperature and see how that affects how much can dissolve and how fast things can dissolve. So which dissolves faster? One teaspoon of sugar grains or one teaspoon cube of sugar? Now I put teaspoon in here twice to say these three cubes equal this pile. Okay, because right there's a little bit of space here, a little bit of space here, there's none over here. If we would smash up these cubes, it would be this much. So these are equal amounts. Be careful. Don't. I'm not asking you for one grain versus one big cube. I'm asking you for this amount in cube form, this amount that's in granule or grain form. So I have the same amount of each. These are the little grains. These are three big cubes. Which one's going to dissolve faster? In other words, little pieces or a chunk. And I can think of it this way too. Instead of three chunks and tons of little pieces, I can say, all right, same size. I have one big chunk or I broke it up into little pieces. What dissolves faster? Little pieces. Well, it's like half the work has been done already, right? Dissolving is breaking something apart. And little pieces are already partially broken apart. So it's like half the work is done for you. So they're going to dissolve faster. Another way to look at it. Little pieces have more surfaces that can be attacked at once. Remember, it's very violent. Those water molecules come in, boom, 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 all over, all over can attack. Whereas here, it can only attack the outer surfaces. It can only attack outer surfaces here too, 
but there are a lot more outer surfaces. So little pieces have more area that can be attacked at once. Therefore, if we put it together and sound more scientific, little pieces have more surface area. And since they have more surface area, or more places that can be attacked at the same time, they will dissolve faster. Okay, so let's look at another thing. So here we looked at size and surface area. Now we're going to look at temperature. When does one teaspoon of sugar dissolve faster? In hot water or cold water? Well, what's technically the difference between hot and cold water? They're both H2O, but when you heat something up, what is true about the molecules? The molecules move faster. So hot water is going to be dissolving faster because the faster the solvent molecules move, the more collisions will occur between the solvent and the solute, and therefore it's going to dissolve faster. So more moving, more collisions, faster dissolving. Now, of course, there's exceptions in chemistry, right? So let's read this part, and then we'll read it, an exception. So a change in temperature affects solubility. If you put salt in water, you will finally come to a point where the solution becomes saturated. Do you remember that word from last lesson? A saturated solution is one in which no more solute can dissolve in the solvent under specific conditions. For example, 100 grams of water at 10 degrees Celsius can dissolve no more than 35 grams of salt. The solution is a saturated one, but 100 milliliters of water, so the same amount of water, at 99 degrees Celsius can dissolve up to 40 grams. So when we heat it up, instead of dissolving 35 grams, it dissolves 40 grams of salt before it is saturated. Solubility is usually expressed as grams of solute per 100 milliliters of solvent. And we'll get into that part later. Now, think of a warm can of soda. What is dissolved in the soda besides all the chemicals that give it flavor? There's also what kind of gas? Carbon dioxide. So. Let's look at this. Gas solutions behave differently with regard to saturation. When a gas is dissolved in a liquid solvent, an increase in temperature reduces solubility. The opposite of what happens with most liquids and solids and solids and liquids. The gas molecules are moving so quickly that at a higher temperature, they will leave the liquid at a high rate. Okay, so it's not just that they're bouncing around, but they're bouncing around so crazy fast, they can escape. There you go. Move that back over there. <laughs> it can escape. So, for example, carbon dioxide, the gas that makes soda fizz, has a solubility in water of about 0.2 grams per liter at 10 degrees Celsius. Raising the temperature to 60 degrees Celsius, though, drops the solubility below 0.1 gram per liter. So if you have warm soda, it goes flat a lot sooner when it's open than if you have cold soda because the gas is warmer and it's going to escape even faster. So usually, almost always, the warmer it is, the more something dissolves. An exception would be, think of gas in a liquid such as warm soda. Warm soda goes flatter faster because the gas has too much energy and it just escapes. The solubility of a gas solute varies with pressure. In everyday circumstances, pressure changes have little impact on solutes that are solids or liquids. However, if the solute is a gas, pressure plays a key role. The release of carbon dioxide from a just open bottle of soda is an example of pressure changing the solubility of carbon dioxide. When a carbonated beverage is bottled, the pressure of the system is relatively high. Opening the bottle causes a dramatic drop in pressure of the system. As a result, the carbon dioxide will bubble or fizz or pssst out of the liquid. The reason is that under high pressure, the carbon dioxide is much more soluble in water than at low pressure. So it's forced in here. And as soon as you pop that top off, pssst, some of it escapes. So more carbon dioxide can be dissolved in a liquid when the contents are under pressure and kept under pressure. That's why if you have a closed bottle or can of soda, you can have it in your basement for a month and it will still be bubbly. You have a can of soda, you open it and let it sit on the kitchen table, it's flat by the end of the day. 
So pressure forces the gas to stay dissolved in the soda. All right, let's go back to sugar. When does one teaspoon of sugar dissolve faster? When it's stirring or letting it sit? And it is stirring because, again, the more motion, the more collision, the more bombardment, the more it's being attacked, the faster it dissolves. Dissolution rate, or how fast something dissolves, is a measure of how quickly or slowly the substance dissolves. There is another equally important aspect of solution formation, and this is how much of a solute can dissolve in a solvent. So remember, we're talking about how quickly and how much. Solubility is the usual maximum amount of a solute that will dissolve in a solvent under specific conditions of temperature and pressure. In other words, how much will dissolve. For example, calcium chloride has a solubility in water of about 41 grams per liter at 50 degrees Celsius and 1 atm. But at 50 degrees Celsius and 1 atm, more than 90 grams of calcium nitrate can dissolve in water. So, both of them had 50 degrees and 1 atm. So they were very careful to say we have the exact same thing. Okay, and calcium chloride, we said that it has 41 grams per liter. And look down here though, that's calcium chloride. If I have calcium nitrate, how much of that can dissolve? Not 41 grams per liter, but 90 grams per liter. So we can say calcium nitrate has a higher solubility, or in other words, it can hold more of the solute than calcium chloride at 50 degrees Celsius and 1 atm of pressure. So the more it can dissolve, the higher the solubility. So more solute that can dissolve equals higher solubility. We also have the word insoluble. So we have the word soluble, but now it's in. Insoluble means it does not dissolve. Some solutes have little or no solubility in water. Some su substances, like oil or mercury, do not dissolve in water. As such, they are said to be insoluble in water. You may have heard the phrase, oil and water don't mix. You can now say that oil is insoluble in water. So you pour them together and it looks like they might mix, but right away you see that the oil separating out and specifically, if we look at it, you can see what shape does it take. There's spheres, right? All kinds of little bubbles basically because that's the way to get the least amount of surface area and that's the best way for the oil to avoid the water. And so that's why you get the droplets inside because the oil is crunching up to get away and then at the end to float on top of the water. Dissolution and solubility are important aspects of solution. So solution formation depends on solubility, how much. It depends on dissolution, how fast. And how much and how fast something dissolves depends on temperature, surface area, if you're going to mix it and if it's soluble at all or if it's insoluble like oil and water. Dissolution rate or dissolving rate is a measure of how quickly or slowly a solute dissolves in a solvent. Temperature, surface area, and pressure can all affect the rate of solution formation, that is, the rate of dissolving. Solubility, on the other hand, is a measure of how much solute will dissolve in a solvent under certain conditions. A solution that can allow no more dissolution of solute, or in other words, no more can dissolve, is called a saturated solution. A solute that will not dissolve in a particular solvent, like oil will not dissolve in water, is said to be insoluble. Factors that can affect solubility are temperature and sometimes pressure, especially if it's a gas, and don't forget about surface area. For some reason, people seem to get this one mistaken. Remember, the smaller the pieces, the more surface area, the more edges. Assuming, of course, that we're starting with one pile that's the same size as the other pile. So smaller pieces, more edges, more surface area. All right, go ahead and do the pre-quiz, and then when you're ready, um, do the quiz. As always, if you have questions, let me know.